want to welcome everybody to today's event. Uh, thank you for joining us. We are doing How to Use Imagery Like the Pros with the amazing Nolan Hames. Today, it, this is being co-hosted by Dave Zielinski, the editor of Presentation Expert, and myself, Sharon Fitzpatrick. That's how you can find us on Twitter. Stay connected with us. We're on a number of platforms, and we definitely want to try and make sure that you reach out to us. You can find content. We've built communities so you can have a resource. And with that, it gives me great pleasure to turn this over to my co-host, Dave Zielinski. Thank you, Sharon. Nolan, uh, gr great seeing you recently at the Presentation Summit in New Orleans and attending your typically uh, well-received sessions, including a fabulous one on using imagery that you'll expand upon today. Nolan's credentials speak for themselves. He has more than 20 years of experience in the field of visual communication, helping organizations tell better stories with fewer words, and has created high-end presentations, keynote addresses, and pitches for some of the world's top organizations. He's also been recognized as one of only 11 PowerPoint MVPs in the U.S. by Microsoft. So with that, Nolan, I will hand it over to you, and good luck. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Sharon. I love doing uh, these webinars for, uh, for, pre for Presentation Expert, and I'm glad um, we have so many people uh, attending today. I tend to show a lot of slides, um, if anyone's ever uh, seen me present before, so I will be going through things uh, quickly. I, I always want to give you guys more rather than less. So, uh, But as Sharon mentioned, there is a handout, so uh, the majority of these slides are in that handout. So if I go through something quickly, um, de definitely it should be in the handout. You can review later. Um, I will ask occasionally uh, maybe for some feedback via chat. Um, if you do have questions, throw them in the question uh, pane, but I'm going to leave it to Sharon to sort of uh, look through those and, and uh, jump in at an appropriate time and, and cut me off there. So um, the next hour is all about imagery. Half of my work um, at Nolan Hames Creative is training, actually training people on site and through webinars, but the other half is project work. Uh, we create presentations and visual communications for people. So a lot of the stuff we're talking about today is literally what we're doing day in, day out, how we professional designers work with imagery in presentation. Um, I've kind of uh, put this into three sections today. The first is going to be finding and sourcing imagery. Uh, the next is putting it into your presentation. And the last is editing it. Um, those are some the, the kind of vague categories, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll expand on each one of those. Um, the, the point is, at the end of the day, to get as far from a slide like you see up on your screen now as possible. This is the dreaded death by bullet point, the you know slide you mint, the, the just the, the what I call 1990s sort of stereotypical PowerPoint. Textual uh, information is not really the way people's brains want to receive information. And, and again, if you've seen me uh, present before, um, th this is going to be familiar, but I, I like reinforcing this because I think it's so important to, for people to understand initially that textual information like this is not the best way to your audiences. And that's because of something called the picture superiority effect. I didn't make this up. This is a real scientifically studied thing. And what it, uh, what it says basically is that humans want to receive information as images far more than they want to as text. They remember information, they process information infinitely better as an image than they do as text, which is why putting images in our presentation is so important. And the, the test I always do is, which I'll do right now, is everybody right now think of beer. Okay, whatever that means to you, think of beer, whether you're a beer drinker or not, get it in your mind. Now, I have to imagine, I'm going to play sort of mentalist here right now, some people are thinking of a, a bottle of Corona, right? Some people are thinking of maybe a, a, a pint of Guinness with a foamy head. Some people are maybe thinking of uh, cans of uh, Bud Light or something like that. But what I can guarantee nobody, nobody on this webinar right now is thinking of in their head is this, the letters B-E-E-R. It's because you're all humans, I, I assume, and your brains are simply not wired to work in text, to think in text. This is the way our brains are wired to think. 
some people more than others. But this is the way our brains want to process information when given the choice, um, not through text. So the old model of presentation ignored this, it sort of ran completely counter to this. The old model was, let me write all my bullet points on the left side of the page, and then on the right side, let me you know, go to Google and steal an image uh, or two and throw them sort of on the right side of the page, right? And we, we've all done this, we're all guilty of it, but it's not the most effective uh, way of presenting. The new model, the much more effective model is, let's start with that imagery. Let's start with good, dynamic, communicative imagery. Uh, hopefully that's not stolen. We'll get to that in a second. Um, and let the slide be about that first and foremost, and then add in text that is necessary for uh, clarification. Only as much text as is absolutely necessary. If we look at a slide like this, is this old thinking or new thinking? It's, it's old thinking model. It's the couple of, you know, you know, couple of sentences, text, and then, oh, let me go get an image that says poverty. But how could we very quickly redesign this slide, um, very quickly, to be the new model? We simply make it about the image, and we make that image full screen. And then, we, yes, we still need some text. I'm not saying we're going to be able to get rid of text completely, but it's far more minimized right now. So now the image is doing the communication is doing the heavy lifting of the message rather than the text, and that's where we kind of want to get to. So that's the sort of preamble for today. Um, but let's talk about specifically, you know, specifically getting our hands dirty with imagery. And the first, I put this right up front because the first question everybody's going to have is, okay, fine, where do I get imagery? You just told me I can't steal it from Google. So let's talk about sourcing imagery. Uh, first and foremost, we'll get it out of the way. Uh, before I even get into this, though, to answer another question that's on the, the probably tip of your tongue or fingers about to type, there is a document that you, I will tell you where to download this later. You can download this from my website. This is a resource guide for imagery that you can buy for a lot of money, a little money, uh, for free, where you can get icons. So don't frantically screenshot this or anything. Um, I will tell you where you can download this, uh, this file from my site uh, later. So I will be giving you a whole lot of uh, places where you can go get imagery. But let's talk about just a, a couple of them. I obviously can't talk about all of them. Or we, that would be the whole hour. But there are sites that are professional stock sites such as Shutterstock or iStock. Um, the one I use uh, on a daily basis is Shutterstock. It has a subscription model. That, that I find works well for me. I can download 25 images a day. I think they recently changed their model, so you can now do a few hundred a month as opposed to daily. But regardless, it's kind of like an all-you-can-eat buffet or a, or a lot you can eat. <laughs> you can't download everything. But of their 35 million images, you can download a whole bunch every day or a whole bunch each month. And that, to me, is far better than a lot of other sites that are a la carte. Um, I know iStock now, I think, has some sort of subscription model, but they still, they're still sort of the, the, the credit um, a la carte type uh, situation that I don't like having to, to determine each time in a presentation, oh, I want an image, how much am I willing to spend for it? Do I want to spend $15 for the high res, or maybe the medium res is okay for 10 It's too much stress. It's too much... I, there's, I, I don't want to do that. I just want to be able to go to a site, grab an image, sometimes grab five, ten images, and cut nine of them later on. So I don't want to have to worry about paying each time. So that's why I like a, a model like Shutterstock and Thinkstock uh, has the same model where you can sort of have this upfront subscription. So yes, this is going to cost you money. Not a fortune. You know, for a lot of you work for very big corporations, uh, you're spending money on a lot of things, uh, spending a lot of money. Um, you know, just think about your catering budget for your last meeting. Um, that's probably a couple of months of, of a Shutterstock subscription. So I think if we're in the business of, of communicating professionally, we can spend some money on images. But you don't have to spend this much money. Um, there are some great sites, Dreamstime, Photolia. You can get images for a few cents, for a dollar. Um, Canva um, is, is a great um, a newer solution. You get images for a dollar there. So again, there some of these cheaper sites are in in that uh, resource guide. Um, do you even have to spend a dollar? No. Sometimes you can get images for free. There's a great site called Morgfile. 
Um, is it going to have the quality and the breadth of images of a Shutterstock or a ThinkStock? No, but you know, for a lot of your situations, it might be just fine. So morgue file is free. Um, but there are other sites where you can get Creative Commons imagery. Uh, in Creative Commons, if you're not familiar with it, it's it's a it's a licensing uh, format, I, I guess, a, a license you know, a license that people put on their own images and then put them out on the internet for people to use. And there, there are different levels of it. I'm not going to get too much into the weeds on it, but uh, there are different levels. But essentially, if you give the person credit, if you don't use it in, you know, certain commercial ways, you can use this imagery. Uh, and you can find that on, uh, again, there, there are a number of different sites, but Flickr has a, uh, you can search by Creative Commons. There's a great site called Comp Fight. Again, it's all in the resource guide where you can search for Creative Commons. So I always say, say to people, if you're looking for a picture of the Eiffel Tower, you do not need to pay any money for that. And the reason is the Eiffel Tower has been photographed millions and millions of times by some pretty good amateur photos, even maybe some professionals who just said, hey, I want to make this image available to the world under Creative Commons. Here it is. So you don't have to spend 10 bucks at iStock for a picture of the Eiffel Tower. You can get it on Flickr or Comfite or some other places uh, under Creative Commons. There you go. Um, every once in a while, people will uh, have an image and they want to use it or they want to use it correctly. Maybe it, you know it's it's a Franken deck and people have been pulling images and slides from from all different places and they genuinely want to do the right thing, and they're like, where did this image come from? There are some reverse image sites. Uh, I know Google has one, but the one I like is tineye.com. So it allows you to upload an image or go to a URL where the image is on web, and it will tell you where that image came from. And I gotta say, about 90% of the time, it nails it. It will show you places on the web where you can find it. And a lot of it's you know blog posts, but it'll say, hey, this image is available for purchase on ThinkStock, or iStock, or wherever. Uh, or Dreams Time, or more, it's available here, so you can then get it officially and legally, and in most often, you know, higher resolution if you need it. So a reverse image search can be great for doing the right thing, um, and and again, getting a higher res image too, which is really important. So where can you get this resource guide that, that I put together? And believe me, this is not uh, comprehensive. There are hundreds and hundreds of stock sites out there. Every time I, I update this or I, 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 I try to write a new blog post about it, there are more out there. They keep proliferating. Now, a lot of the new ones, they, don't, they might have thousands of images or even tens of thousands. They don't have the 35 million of the shutter stock, but some of them are specialty. There's great stuff out there. So where can you get this? If you go to my website, my blog, presentyourstory.com, and all you need to do is just subscribe. It's on the front page. Just hit the subscribe. A couple of emails. I really promise I won't bombard your, your uh, inbox with lots of stuff, but once you subscribe, you'll get access to a page that not only has this, but has thousands of logos uh, in, power, in PowerPoint ready format. Um, there's my QAT, quick access toolbar. There's a whole bunch of things up there. There's my resource file where you can get vector maps and things. There's a lot of goodies on that page. So all you need to do is subscribe and you'll, you'll be able to get access to that. Okay. Um, right, so let's, uh, let's move on. We're, we're trying to source imagery, right? We're trying to decide what image to use. And this becomes a big decision uh, to make, metaphoric or literal. Now, what do I mean by this exactly? Well, th there's this, there's this uh, popular way of using imagery and in presentation that, that we've seen a lot of. Let, let me show you an example. Something like this. Um, the, the lemonade stand, right? Uh, or the, uh, let me show you this one. The, uh, the, the guys climbing a mountain, and I don't, I think actually the, I might, the slides don't seem to be updating, but, uh, ah, there we go, might say there's a little lag, at least on my end. Uh, so these are metaphoric images. Now, these might be okay if your business is, I don't know, selling lemonade, or if you're a Sherpa, but if you're selling widgets, if you're doing something else, these are not good images to use, because people remember imagery, right? That's the way they think. So when they think back to your presentation, they're going to remember lemonade. They're going to remember thing. They're not going to remember what you actually do. Look at a, a slide like this, a solid, this is a great image. And, and the, 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 uh, 
the, the temptation is there because you can get great imagery like this on these stock sites. So which is a better image to use when you want to talk about your sales team? Is it this or is it this? To me, there's no question, hands down, you're talking about your great sales team, I want to see them unless you sell puzzle pieces. And if you do, great, use that image at the top left, go for it. Uh, this was a presentation, these are uh, two slides from a presentation that I uh, did for a client. They were speaking at a conference, they had about 20 slides of thing advice they wanted to give to their, uh, their um, these, these community uh, organizations and these nonprofits. And I, I looked through it all and there were a lot of, you know, we ended up, to, to be frank, we ended up having to do some slides like this, you know, cultivate trust and accomplishment, clear values and vision. But were they telling their audience that they really needed to do trust falls, you know, to be a successful organization? No, that, that's a metaphoric image. So these were the, you know, the second best option, think slides like this. But what we were able to do in a lot of other places was get literal imagery. So let me show you what I mean. This was another slide uh, that they did. They wanted to talk about strong facilitation. Now, that's kind of a tough concept, right? What are we going to do? We're going to do the trust balls again. We're going to do uh, um, some clip art or uh, who knows, you know, a couple people, you know, huddling. So I talked to them. I actually talked to my client and I said, what does strong facilitation mean to you in, in this situation? What are you really trying to say? And they said, well, we want all of our, our attendees or organizations to, whenever they meet with their grantees and their local communities, to have somebody in that meeting that's a strong facilitator that can, that can guide the conversation so it doesn't get off the rails. Somebody like Fred from last year. And I said, who's Fred? They said, well, Fred was this guy at last year's conference that moderated all the panels. And he was like the best facilitator anybody had ever seen. We were all talking about him. He was great. We didn't know where he came from. And I said, well, do you have any photos of Fred? And they said, well, yeah, we, we've got some photos from last year's conference. So this slide turned in to this. And there's Fred. I, I don't remember if that's his name, but I'm, I'm calling him Fred for now. So this was when shown to this audience, everybody who saw the conference last year says, oh, I get it. That's what you mean by strong facilitation. Be like Fred. Here's another example from that same presentation. Organizations have different capacities. Well, I looked through all the photos they sent me and I found this incredible photo from last year's presentation showing one of the attendees clearly demonstrating that he does not have the capacity of let's say a Ford Foundation or a MacArthur Foundation. He's a small little, you know, run, works for a small little nonprofit in between sessions. He's trying to do the work of 10 people. So that was a, these two are literal images. So whenever you have the option, go literal. Trust me on this one. Sometimes it can be tough. Sometimes you've got to do a lot of searching and a lot of thinking, but go literal whenever you can. So let's talk about some, uh, some design aspects when you're sourcing imagery, when you're trying to decide um, what to use. And you always want to look for empty space. Uh, oh, I'm supposed to get my mouse off the screen. Sorry. Uh, thanks, guys. So you always want to look for imagery that has uh, empty space, also called negative space, also called white space. This is one of the most important uh, principles of graphic design. Now, when you pull up search results, when you pull up a slide like uh, a page like this, you're looking at all these images. Me as a as a designer, what images for presentation? What images are it, it does my eye go to naturally? It goes to these because these are both images that have great negative space in them, right? Natural negative space. That these images are telling me, hey, you're going to be able to put some content over that. You're going to be able to put some text over that because we are going to need text. So when you are looking for imagery, find imagery that has negative space. Uh, here it's just sort of a, a, a fake sort of background. That works. But also imagery that has natural negative space. I mean sky, sand, uh, snow, grass, you know, a, a, a brick wall, a stone wall, something. Uh, these are all uh, images recycling through now. That, ha that have great natural negative space to it. Uh, a lot of times you can help this by cropping your images in a certain way to um, you know, get more negative space in and zooming in. 
Um, but you want to shoot for things that have this sort of breathing room because it will allow you to put content over it, but also allow the eye to focus a little bit more on the content, in this case, the plane. That's what ultimately negative space does. It forces the eye, um, forces the eye to, uh, to focus on, on the subject of an image. You really don't want images that have so much going on and the content sort of like pouring off the side of the page because it's, it's just too much. We, we call those noisy images. Here's another uh, real, uh, real slick um, designer trick. Uh, this is one I, I learned uh, years ago when I was doing a lot of pharma work and, and at, at an agency. And in, uh, we would do slides like this, and, and invariably, somebody would have a problem with it. Now, I, I'd, here, look, I, I want to see if this works. I don't know if it's going to work on the webinar, but in the chat uh, box, I want you guys to play bad client now. So I'm the designer and I bring it to you. I want you to find fault with this slide and this image specifically. Just, well, there's got to be something wrong with it. Tell me why you don't like this, uh, this guy here. Nolan, we're getting a lot of comments, negative statement, he's too young. Oh, okay, great. I, I, for some reason I'm not seeing that, but that's, okay, exactly. Okay, so too young. All right, I got it. Now, um, all right. Well, let me uh, let me fix that. How about this? Is that any better? Are you being a bad client still for me? Probably a lot of people are saying, "No, too old. I don't like the beard." All right. Well, let let me get better. All right. How about this? No, too too young again. Maybe she could be uh, confused for a nurse, and this definitely has to be doctor. Okay. How how about this? Definitely. No, well, he's got a beard again, he's smiling, he's too... Here's what I got working you know, for, with, with my colleagues, with clients. There was always a problem with the image. So what do you do to avoid this? You simply take the head off. You crop out the person's head. Now, is he too old? Is he does, do we not like his expression? Do we, do we not like the facial hair? No, all of that kit goes away and we can focus on what he is and what he's doing, which is a doctor looking at a tablet. Yes, you can still argue that he's a man, but at least we are taking away all that other really crap, those excuses, that people are going to find an excuse. So, th it's, now this is hard. This is hard to find imagery without heads or without faces. So a lot of times you have to crop. but. If you can find imagery with the back to the audience, I, I just did this for a client uh, like about a month ago. So in two cases, we had shots that showed the back, so it was great. We didn't see expressions. We could focus on what they were doing. The one on the left, I had to crop her head out. So you, you can do both, but look for imagery in which the subject matter really shines and comes through and the personality of the person sort of gets subjugated by being out of frame. So. Again, that is a real sneaky designer trick, but it's one we pull out of our pockets when we have difficult clients and or we know it's going to happen. So um, use it. it. Again, it's just it really focuses on what they're doing as opposed to who they are. And in most often, we want to see what they're doing, what they represent. Uh, all right. So that is sort of a section on finding and sourcing. Let's now go into actually putting it into the presentation. And, uh, and first of all, I'm breaking my own rule by using a, a metaphoric image here, but I liked it, so I get to break the rules if, uh, if I'm presenting. So um, let's talk about size. Now, this is, a, this is a, a fraught topic that we could spend the next hour debating and, and talking about, but I want to try to do this as quickly as possible, but I do want to go into the technical uh, side of images for just a, a hopefully a few minutes because I think it is important to know, but trust me, at the end of this, just in a few slides, I'm going to tell you what size your images should be to put into presentation. Okay? I am going to give you a, so what, Here, here's my rule of thumb. But first of all, what you do need to understand is when people ask, what size should my image be, you have to understand that it is going to be dependent on your hardware, ultimately. We, there, every screen out there, every projector has different percentage, have, has different uh, abilities 
to show pixels. You can have a you can have a you know a small projector, and actually most projectors do not show that many pixels because they're they have this long throw distance, and the farther you're away from a screen, the fewer you actually need. So you know an average projector might only show 800 by 600 pixels, whereas you know a 4K super high res TV might show 4,000. Uh, so no matter what size, no matter how big of an image you put in your presentation, you could put one of these like 50 gigabyte NASA images with billions of pixels into your PowerPoint slide. If you're only showing it on a laptop or a projector that can only show 800 pixels, all those other pixels that you put in are wasted. They're they're not being shown. So that's what I say that it's ultimately going to depend on your hardware. Now, traditionally, to, to go back, and, and there, this, this is a bit of a myth, but I'm going to talk traditionally uh, about screen versus print. There's some technical reasons why it's kind of a myth, but traditionally, screen resolution was 72 DPI, and you can still sort of think about that today. And what that means is for every inch, DPI stands for dots per inch. Uh, sometimes you might see it as PPI, points per inch, or pixels per inch. But basically, every inch of screen real estate, there were 72 dots, 72 pixels packed in there. Now, for print, you needed higher resolution. You needed more pixels packed in more densely um, because it was close to your eyes, and there's just you just needed that for print. That still is basically 300 DPI. It can be a little less sometimes, a little more, but that's sort of the, the general rule of thumb. So that's where we're starting from. Now, if you take a 3 inch inch by 5 inch image at 72 TPI in PowerPoint and you make it smaller, you actually increase the, the dots per inch because we're not resampling. All the dots don't go anywhere. They simply get tighter and tighter. They get pushed tighter and tighter together. So for each inch, we actually get more pixels. That works. So you can always put an image that's, too, that's big and squeeze it down. So for example, if you have an image and you print it and it's blurry but you still want to use it, well, you can make it smaller in PowerPoint and then it will then it may print fine because you're increasing that density of pixels. However, it does not work the other way around. <laughs> if you have a small image that is at 100%, now you always need to check in PowerPoint if you didn't put the image in, you need to check is it at 100%, is it at 20% uh, because that that can obviously affect things. But let's assume we have a 100% sized image at 72 dpi. If we suddenly try to make it bigger, you're going to see exactly what happens. You're going to see those blurry pixels. So we don't want that. Again, I promise I'm going to get you to an actual um, uh, number here. So what size should it be when I put in there? What size should I tell my graphic designers um, if they're preparing imagery for me? The screen sizes we're working with if we're doing widescreen, it's going to be 7.5 inches high by 13.33 inches wide. Now, there's some people that like to think in pixels on the screen, but PowerPoint thinks in inches. And to be perfectly honest, I think in inches. So this is the size of a widescreen PowerPoint slide. It's the default in uh, 2013. I believe in earlier versions, it was actually 5 point something, which was a mistake on Microsoft's part. So if you do have a, a, if you are setting up a slide in an older version, trust me, you want to set it up at seven and a half inches high by 13.33 wide. Or standard size has not changed over the years. That's seven and a half inches high by 10 inches wide. So if we assume that these are our our slides we're working with, our our canvas, and we also have to make the assumption of what our hardware is going to be, we don't know. But let's assume it's a high res L LCD screen, 1920 by 1080. That's kind of a standard. Right? We've all seen those dimensions. Let's assume that's our standard. We're not you know, making a, a, a slide to be shown on IMAX. Or if we were, you sh don't need this webinar. You, you already know about technical stuff. So if we start doing some math and we know it's going to be shown on that, if we have a, a slide that's 13.33 by 7.5 inches, so it, fit, it fills the screen basically, what that equals is an image that's 150 dots per inch. That is an appropriate resolution for a widescreen PowerPoint slide. If we're doing standard, we're, we're going to cut the edges off, and because of the math's a little different, it becomes uh, 144 DPI. But what, all, what does all this mean to you at the end of the day? To show a, a, a picture at actual size, and in this case we're assuming it's going to fill the screen, 150 
dots per inch is what you should use. That is a good balance. It will print okay. It will show on screen beautifully. If you're doing, if you're, if you're only printing and you need it's really high res and crisp, yeah, you're going to want to go up a little more, maybe to 250, maybe even a 300 DPI. But for on screen, this is the rule of thumb that I tell people. Now, let's say you don't know, you can't figure out what your dots per inch is. You don't have Photoshop, you don't have a graphic designer. Here's what I also tell people. People say, is this image high, re high res enough for me to use in a presentation? Well, here's what I tell those people to do. I say, okay, put it, into your, put it onto a slide, go into the conference room or wherever you're going to be showing this and put it up on the screen. Does it look blurry? No? Great. You have an image that's good to use. Might it be a little higher than you actually need it to be? Maybe, but you can always go higher. You can always have an image that's too big. It'll still look great. What about print, people say? Well, will, th will this print okay? And I say, I don't know. Why don't you send it to your color printer and tell me what you see? Is the print blurry? No, then it's good to use. If they say, yes, it's blurry, then I say, well, then you can't use it. Or, you know, use it at your own risk. Um, so that's really the, the, if all else fails, this is how you determine resolution. I did say before that uh, it's always okay to use an image that's too big. You know, yeah, you can, and again, those are wasted pixels, but it doesn't matter. It'll still show perfectly. But if you get into a point where you feel like your, your presentations are getting bloated uh, because of size and you really want to reduce them, um, you can compress the images. So it's always okay to bring in a, a too high resolution image and then compress it later. But I do not recommend using PowerPoint's compression tools. Uh, what I, I, uh, somebody at the presentation seminar actually gave a great metaphor. They said, PowerPoint's compression tools are a hammer <laughs> where we want a chisel. And the chisel tool is something called NX PowerLight. This is not an expensive program. Uh, they have enterprise versions of it. They have a couple different options and desktop versions. It can even sort of work in through Outlook, or as you send a file, it compresses it on the fly. But NX PowerLight's a great company out of England. They do magic with presentations, with PowerPoint, and all Office files, actually. They'll do PDFs as well. I don't know how they do it, but somehow they compress images within a presentation without um, without you even noticing. I mean, they, it just it takes out file size, it, it brings it down, and the resolution is still beautiful. And you, you, you have settings. You can set it for screen print. You have a lot of control over it. This is what I recommend. Please, please try to avoid compressing using PowerPoint's tools. Uh, just to know, PowerPoint does, every time you save it, does do some compression behind the scenes you can't turn off. But what I'm talking about is that, that compress uh, uh, images button at the top left. Really, do yourself a favor and, and don't use that. So what format should you use? Right? JPEG, PNG, TIFF, GIF, or GIF, or whatever, they're all out there. For presentation, you pretty much want to stick to JPEG and PNG. What's the difference? A JPEG um, is going to be smaller by uh, design. Uh, JPEG is a compressed format meant for images, like snapshots and things, in which it saves pixels. So it's actually saving room by compressing things. And that's fine for an, images like this. It's fine for snapshots, for pictures of people with lots of stuff going on. If you use a PNG, it's going to be higher. It's also fine for these types of images, but it is going to be higher. Now, I go back and forth and, and I use both of these images, these formats. Why would I use a JPEG over a PNG? I might use a JPEG, first of all, if, if that's simply the format that I get from, like, if I download a stock image, generally it's going to be a JPEG. Uh, there's no need for me to really convert it. Uh, I'm just going to leave it as JPEG. When I might use a PNG, is, well, if it starts as a PNG and I just, I'm lazy, I don't want to convert it, and I don't care about file size. But also PNGs I'll use if I'm creating like a template or any sort of slide or image library that I, know's, that I know is going to be used over and over and over for years to come. And the reason is that a JPEG, every time it's saved, every time it's moved from one presentation to another, every time a JPEG is resaved, it will degrade in quality because that's the way the format works. 
every time it's saved, the JPEG says, I want to save quality, I want to save quality, so I'm going to get rid of some pixels. Now, the first few times that happens, or the first hundred times that happens, you may not notice anything different about the image. But eventually down the road, you're going to notice it. And we're going to come back to that in one second. PNGs um, should be used also for logos. Partly for this reason, a J well, for two reasons. JPEG always has to have something in the background, like a, like a white background. And we've all seen this for logos, right? But PNGs can be transparent. And that's what we want for logos, so we can put them over any sort of background. So any type of logo, if you go to my website and down, download all those logo folders, uh, all, they're all in PNG. Uh, that's so you can, and they're very high res, you can put them over anything. But here's the other reason. I, I said every time a JPEG is saved over and over, it degrades. So when you first put in a JPEG or a PNG in this situation, right, eh, they both look the same. But over time, that JPEG on the left, as it gets saved over and over and over, it's going to start to degrade. And we've all seen this. And you probably ask yourself, why would somebody put a blurry version of the logo in this presentation? Well, they didn't. But over time, over the three years that it's been passed around and saved and resaved, that logo gets degraded. So that's why uh, PNGs will never degrade the way JPEGs will. You want, you want to do uh, PNGs for logos. OK, so that's, uh, that's format. Let's. Um, Let's talk more about placement of images as we insert it. We want our images to be big and bloody. What do I mean by that? Well, we want them to be big, as big as the image as the slide will allow, and we also want them to bleed. Meaning, bleed is a is a technical is a printer term for basically falling off the edge of the page. It goes right to the edge. There's no border. This is a great image. The moment we put it into a like a, a bad template. And you know, we suddenly see the edges of the image. It's it's starting to get a little lame, right? We want our images to be big and to bleed off the the, the slide. Here are a couple of examples of image of great images that just bleed off. They, they they speak so much more loudly when you see the whole image, when it's the entirety of the screen, um, not when it's just you, know, you see sort of a white border or when it's that small little image on the right side. All images, you know, we want them to be full screen. We want to find a way. We want to choose images with negative space uh, so we can put that over the image. Uh, that's a, another really important reason for it. If you need to show a lot of images, make a big collage and let them bleed off the edge of the page. You don't have to do that one, two, three box of an image down the right side of a page. If you're using an image that has eyeballs in it, meaning an image uh, of a person, of a statue, of an animal, you want that image to face inward. You want those eyeballs to face towards your content because that tells your audience, hey, look at my content. All right, look inward. Don't so this is a good you this is a good placement, I should say, of this image. Uh, this is not a good placement of this image. He's looking off the page and he's you know, basically, we're telling our audience, "Don't look at my content. Look off to the edge of the screen." Um, and of course, this is a really bad use of, of the image, so we we wouldn't want to do that at all. But as you start looking at layouts, just as you start looking at professional layouts, just notice that the person is always looking into the frame uh, and hopefully looking at the content. Uh, again, whether they're standing, whether they're you know, it's a it's a real close cropped in face shot. Whatever it is, even if they're just slightly turned, they're always going to be slightly turned into the page. It helps create a much better layout. So, and you can always flip images. You know, so if the image comes in and they're looking off the screen, just flip it. Uh, hopefully, there's no writing on their T-shirt um, to allow for that. So we want our images to be big and bloody, to bleed off the page. But sometimes we get images which we want to use. This is a great image, but how can I put text over this, right? Not all images come with sort of built in, as much built in negative space as we would like. So a great technique, if you're in a situation like this, this slide clearly doesn't work, this text doesn't work there, simply take a semi-transparent text box and slap it over the image. Now you've built in some negative space and you still have an image that bleeds off the edge, but our content can be read. This is a very simple, simple technique for getting content over a full bleed image. Um, so 
so there's no excuse. Uh, back to this image we uh, we just saw. No excuse. Um, if your image is, if your text, like this image is a little noisy over on the right hand side, so I couldn't just put the text over it. It was kind of disappearing. Just little gradient box, little uh, semi-transparent box. It's all you need. All right, moving on. Again, I always promise I move fast, and I do. The rule of thirds. Um, this is something that if you're not a graphic designer and you know about, if you know what the rule of thirds is, my guess is that you're either an art history major, or you were an art history major, or you're a really good uh, amateur photographer. And the reason is because photographers know about this, and uh, the rule of thirds is something that has gone back for millennia um, in, in the art world. This is not a new thing. The rule of thirds will help you place your imagery on, on a slide much better. So what it is, and, and by the way, you've all seen, if you don't know what this is, you've actually seen it, you just didn't realize it. Because everybody at some point has hit, the, hit, a, hit a button on their digital camera by accident and you get that tic-tac-toe board up and you're like, well, what is this? I don't want it here. And you keep hitting buttons and eventually it goes away. Or you just turn it off and turn it back on. Well, that tic-tac-toe board was trying to help you take a better picture and you didn't want to listen to it. So what the rule of thirds is, it, it is a tic-tac-toe board. So let's look at this image. Um, this, is a, this is a good image, uh, you know, smiling, it's good, good layout, there's negative space. But it's not quite as dynamic as maybe it could be. But if we apply the rule of thirds by... Uh, there we go. Apply the rule of thirds by drawing a tic-tac-toe board over it. Now let's look at where those lines intersect. They intersect at four points. And those four points are the most uh, dynamic, most powerful parts of the layout. So we want to put our important stuff at one of those points. And if we're talking about a person, the most important part of a person is right between their eyes, if we had to pick one point. So we're going to move her, we're going to move that most important point to one of those points. Now, she falls in line to the rule of thirds, and we can put content up, and we have more negative space. But this gets a little more powerful once we really start to think about it, right? It's just, this just layout feels a little more dynamic, right? But as I said, it gets more powerful. It's not just those, those four points. Look at the horizontal lines. You want to line things up with those horizontal lines. The horizon line is lined up pretty much with that top horizontal line. Where the sea meets the sand, that's kind of lined up with the, the, the lower horizontal line. Look at her whole body now. It's lined up on one of those vertical lines. So if you're taking a picture of a sunset, get that tic-tac-toe board up and align the horizon with either the top line or the bottom line. It's going to help you take better photos, and it's going to help you crop things better and lay things out better on screen. Couple of, as you start looking at, at professional layouts, you're going to see the rule of thirds um, in one way or the other. You hear this surfer is now vertically up, up and down on, on that one of those lines. This is a, a print slide that has been divided basically into thirds. When you're doing print slides, meaning never meant to be put up on screen, think about working in thirds, or really even on-screen slides. Think about splitting your slide into thirds. A lot of designers uh, make grids. Um, here's another slide. This is from Nancy Duarte's uh, uh, sli um, uh, slide docs. Sorry. Uh, really, really great book. Uh, if you don't have, you should download, and it's free. Um, and this is all in, in thirds. It's a, it's a layout of thirds. So the rule of thirds is going to help you make better layouts. OK, I think I'm doing OK on time. So uh, let's move now into editing it. So we've got our image in PowerPoint. We've laid it out the right way. We've, you know, we've chosen metaphoric, or sorry, we've chosen literal, not metaphoric. We've made it big and bloody. We've cut the head off our doctors. But now we need to do some editing, right? Do we need to fire up Photoshop as, as our toolkit? Well, no. I mean, Photoshop is a brilliant program that I work in every day, and yet, I do more and more of my photo editing directly in PowerPoint because PowerPoint has some great tools for it. PowerPoint has the, uh, the, the remove background tool, and if you are not using this, you, you got to use it. Um, for time, I'm, I'm not going to do a demo of it right now, but play around with it. Um, if you've ever had trouble, I mean, it, it does take a little work, you know, uh, um, a little trial and error, and I will tell you that technically the longer you draw your lines, 
the better results you'll have. But you're always going to have to draw multiple lines to sort of remove backgrounds and then bring back foregrounds. But here, you can do a lot of editing right in Photoshop. Uh, so this is Derek Jeter. We've cut out the background, all done in Photoshop. And then we've made it black and white. We've thrown a, a drop shadow on it. All PowerPoint. Right, there's no reason to go. In fact, I honestly think the remove background tool in Photoshop, some, in PowerPoint, sometimes works a little quicker and actually more effectively than um, some of the tools in Photoshop. Would I use it to make a cover of Vogue magazine? No, but when I'm doing presentations and I need to work as quickly as possible and I don't want to go back and forth and back and forth to Photoshop, it's great. And the other amazing thing about it is all non-destructive. If at any time you're like, nah, I need the whole, you know, Somebody looks at it is like, now nah, let's just bring the whole you know background back for the Jeter shot. All you do is hit reset and you're done. You don't have to go searching you know through your Photoshop files to get the original. PowerPoint has great recolor tools. Uh, if you see the image down on the left, that's a simple select the image and recolor it to, to green, and that's great. But sometimes you know it doesn't always give you the the results you exactly want. Here's another uh, cool tool that that we designers use, uh, both in PowerPoint and elsewhere turn an image black and white and then put a semi-transparent uh, box over it in the color that you want. And you'll get slightly different results. Like let's say the, the one on the bottom left, there was all that hair was just too black and I wanted to put stuff over it. It was jumping out too much. Well, if you look at the top right, you get a different result. If you look at the bottom right, um, you can actually put a gradient on that, uh, that's, that transparent box. Actually, what it looks like. Um, so you, you get, you, you can, these are called duotones, but you can sort of, there, there are a couple ways to make them. You can do PowerPoint's built-in version, or you can kind of construct it yourself over a black and white image. And again, as you see on the bottom, you can do some cooler effects with gradients, all done in PowerPoint. Okay, so this, this is when I'm going to hop out of slideshow mode. Um, hopefully that's going to work uh, to show you how to do it. This is another situation where you might think, oh, I have to run to Photoshop because I have here this standard size image, but I want it to stretch across the whole slide. Now, hopefully this is going to work here. There we go. Uh, so here's my slide, and yes, I'm using PowerPoint for the Mac 2011. I'm boycotting the new version until they give us a customized QAT. Um, that's another story. So let's say I want this image to stretch completely across the back. I want it to be big and bloody. But if I just stretch the image, he starts getting way too fat, and that's not appropriate, and I don't want to do that to him. But look, I've cut his head off. So I can't do that, but there's a way to stretch just the background right in uh, PowerPoint. And the way to do it is, watch, I'm just going to take a couple steps. I'm going to duplicate the image. Okay. Just make sure it aligns over there, aligned to the top. Now I'm going to go in to crop the image, and I'm going to crop just past the tablet. Okay, so I've got this this like very vague sort of abstract background here, which is basically sitting on top of the other. And now I'm just going to stretch that part of the background. And now I need to, I'm going to select both and send them to the back. And voila. I didn't stretch him at all. I simply stretched this and like this sort of abstract background, and nobody's going to be any the wiser. Now you might also say, "Well, I can't really read the text there." Okay, that's where I bring in my um, little gradient box, and I'll show you a little bit more in a second how we can do that and, and make use of that. Um, and now I've I've done all my Photoshop work right in PowerPoint. Ah, sorry, mouse getting out of control there. Okay, so that's sort of uh, Photoshop in, uh, in PowerPoint. Let's talk about some other sort of cool techniques you can use. Um, I like using this one a lot when I've got an image that, like this image, for example, um, blurring the background. I, let's say I've got this image and it, it's just on the edge. I, it's, I can't make it any bigger without it starting to get blurry because that's the, the best resolution. But I want it to be full screen. I don't really like this sort of floating on a white background. Well, in this case, I took the image and I made it bigger, but then I applied a PowerPoint effect to it, blur, which is one of my favorite uh, effects in PowerPoint. Simply blur the image, throw it in the background, and now we've got sort of full screen imagery. 
You can do this in lots of different ways. Here's a, a, a newspaper article that clearly was never going to fit um, vertical, horizontally. It was not, never going to fill the page, but I took part of it, blurred the background, and plopped it on top. Uh, and, and another example. Uh, this is a great technique. You can play with the level of blurring. Um, this, I mean, you see this all the time on the news reports, right? When somebody, you know, keep people still take uh, videos with their phones vertically. How do you show that on a horizontal TV screen? Well, they they stretch it and they blur the background to sort of give it a full screen effect. But the the blurring uh, that you can do in PowerPoint, you can you can do a lot with it. Um, here, for example, we had a slide, but and it kind of worked. It was over sort of a boardroom, but you know the background was a little too noisy. There was a little too much going on, so uh, I wanted to reduce it and focus more on the content in front. So I simply took that image and I blurred it, and now it recedes into the background. You can kind of still see that it's an office boardroom, but let's say you know even that was too much. Even that was still too distracting. But I want some sort of cool background. We'll take the image and blur it even more. And now you get a completely really cool thing that you know you might have thought, oh, I have to go to a stock site to get that, or I have to make it in Photoshop. It's simply an image you apply to blur to. Now, if this is another cool thing you can do, you can take almost any image, and if you blur it enough, you will get a really cool abstract background. Don't believe me? Here's an image from a, a presentation I did. Uh, this is Meg Whitman. Um, and we took this slide, and for the next couple slides, we simply blurred her. And no, it does not look like her at all, but it brought, it had the same colors, it brought the whole presentation together, and voila. I didn't have to go to Photoshop, I didn't have to do anything, I simply blurred Meg Whitman, and she makes a wonderful abstract background. Um, try it. Gradients. So I gave a little uh, hint of this uh, before with the doctor slide, but this is one of these techniques I use daily. And I use it when I'm in situations like this, uh, where you've got an image, but you see that hard edge. So it bleeds off three sides, but it doesn't. It, the, the, the layout doesn't really feel organic because you've got this hard edge um, image. But we can make, we can force this slide and this image to be a more organic layout by applying a semi-transparent gradient box. Right? Voila! No Photoshop needed. So how do you do this? So simple. You just make a, a box in PowerPoint and you go from 100% white to 0% white or 100% black to 0% black. And I've outlined them and put them on a grid so you can see how this works. And you can do this all the time. It, it's great I mean, you, uh, great for full screen imagery that bleeds off that when you want to put content over it. In this case, the things were a little too noisy, so I just wanted the, the type to pop a little more, so I did. Uh, here's another example where the left side of the image was a little too noisy. This was a case where we actually didn't go to 100% black. I think we went to about like 50 or 60% black. So you don't have to go completely to black. You can still, you know, just do partial. Um, and it just, again, it, 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 it makes everything recede into the background a little more and lets your, your foreground, your text, really pop a little more. Again, you can do it with black, uh, you can do it with white. Uh, here's another um, situation where we had a really noisy image and I just wanted the, I wanted to use the whole image, but I wanted my, my content to pop a little more, so I did. And do you have to make these each time? Absolutely not. Cut and paste them from slide to slide to slide. If you go to my website, there's a file called PPT Assets, and if you download that, you will have lots of stuff in there, including the maps I mentioned and some icon iconography and other stuff, and you'll have these gradients that I, I, I don't make them each time. I go to that file every day, cut and paste, cut and paste. Um, saves me a lot of time. Here's another thing that I cut and paste from that file all the time. It's a vignette. Now, this is, uh, this is actually a PNG file that I did make in Photoshop. Um, you technically could make this in, in PowerPoint, but the results uh, are not good uh, just because of the way PowerPoint sort of makes their center radius gradients. So uh, this is something I pull from every single time. You can go download that file and use it you know, as much as you want. A this, so it's a semi-transparent rectangle with these sort of, you can see, sort of darker spots on the corners and edges. And what that allows you to do is if you want an image to be a little richer, to pop a little more like this image, you just put that over it. You put that little transparent PNG over it 
and it just focuses the eye more. It gives it more depth. It makes it pop a little more. Uh, here are a few more examples. Um, and uh, another place, I didn't mention it before, another great place where you can get imagery and not have to pay for it is when you take it yourself. Um, and these, I was incredibly fortunate to get to go on safari this past summer, so these are all images I took that lie into before. So if you take these images and you just apply that gradient to it, they just pop. And it's going to be different on every image. Like maybe on the bottom right, you know, it's my brother and father, I don't know if that, you know, it helps a little bit, but over white it has a certain effect. But look at that image on the bottom middle. It really focuses on, on those, those uh, I think they're topi, I forget, um, a little more, right? It just, it sort of blacks out all the stuff on the side. So it's a really great um, technique. Okay, uh, last two really quick things. Um, the, uh, just go through go through this quickly. Um, this is These are photo frames that uh, PowerPoint's sort of default photo frame is not so great in my opinion. It, uh, like This is a really cool effect where you have sort of a 3D effect um, and the actual white box, it's, a, it's an optical illusion. The white box is completely square. Uh, it's just the shadow that sort of gives it and all you, all you just take an image and plop, plop it over here these photo frames you can download from that PPT assets things, but I do want to let you know they are built in Photoshop. They are built in PowerPoint. They are simply blurred edge, semi-transparent gray boxes with movable, you know, points on there. So um, again, I just cut and paste these. I use them all the time. The, the great thing about using these because they are made in PowerPoint, they scale infinitely. They scale up and down. You can move the shadow in and out, um, whereas a PNG will get distorted and maybe pixelated. Uh, last thing, you can also get these from that PPT assets file, is if you want to do newspaper tears, you don't have to use a PNG. These are actual PowerPoint shapes, and if I go to edit points, you'll see there are thousands or hundreds and hundreds of little points for all these little tears, and that allows you to simply take content and paste it in. So if you want to like make an, a news article, you throw your headline in there, you uh, got your image, you got your type, and your type really is part of this, which means if I want to scale this up and then I want to make my type bigger, it all, it's all in there. I don't have to resize two different text boxes and a photo. It all just sort of wraps naturally. So uh, again, all this stuff, <laughs> Sorry for, sorry for the continual plugs here, but all this stuff can be gotten on my website. Just subscribe, hit that button, and you'll get the link for this page. Those, all those things I just showed now, PPT assets. Um, so there we go. And I'm, oh, okay, it's 2.59. I know we've got lots of questions, so um, I'm going to stay on for as long as Sharon will let me stay on and as long as you guys want to stay on, but I'm happy to answer um, as many questions as you have. Again, I know I go through stuff really quickly, but again, I want to give you guys more rather than less. So um, go to it, Sharon. I'll, we, I'll have, we have we have lots and lots of questions, and of course, wonderful comments about how much everybody loves you. And when I asked somebody what other topics or speakers would they like to hear, they said Nolan every day. So, oh, well, okay. so everyone has the presentation. So what is the proper place to cite the image source? Do you place it in the small font directly on the picture, underneath the picture? Well, first of all, you don't have to cite a source unless somebody's telling you you have to. Like, I work for um, uh, the Audubon Society, and they, they have a, they simply have an internal um, policy that they want to give photographers credit. So we always put it sort of on the bottom right. Or, but uh, if, if you're using Creative Commons, very often part of the licenses, you do have to cite it. So there is no right or wrong. There is no rule. Make it in my opinion, as um, subtle as possible. So if you have a black background, maybe you put it in like 60% gray, eight point type down in the bottom right. Um, I'm not gonna, uh, some t a lot of times if I have to cite things, I will sometimes put it on the pasteboard itself and not actually on the slide. Um, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not saying that is a, a proper way to do things, I'm just saying that is something I've done in the past. Um, but yeah, just make it really subtle in, in sort of the, the, the lower right hand corner. Um, and if it's like a super long URL, go get a bit.ly link so it doesn't take up the whole page. 
<laughs> yeah, that's it. I think one of our secrets, uh, I know I've learned a lot here too. So I have a question. I know Dave had a question too. So how do you deal with mandatory company templates that can affect how you display images? Uh, that, that, that's a tough one. Um, I personally think that any full screen imagery fits in with any template. I think you can go back and forth. I think that's a great thing about full screen imagery. Now, if you have a company policy that says any image, like we have a standard slide for quote full screen imagery and that it only takes up two thirds of the page and you have to see the logo and it can only be this one layout otherwise you're getting fired, um, sorry, that's your company policy. I don't think it's a good one. Um, I'd be happy to talk to them and tell them why there are other options out there, you know, how you can still have brand identity with that with giving people freedom and having other layouts, but you know, it's going to come down to what you can get by with. Um, just try it. Try a couple slides, try a couple full screen slides in between your template. You can also throw your logo over an image too. Go to the master, copy the, the logo and throw it over as well. So if they have to see the logo in every slide, you know, it's still there. But yeah, corporate templates are going to come down to how you know what your corporate <laughs> template police is like at your at your own place. Well, you know, I've found that a lot of times, sometimes my mistakes I make become my greatest slides. So you never know. Experimentation is a great way to figure it out. Oh yeah. So Dave, go ahead. I know you had a question. Yeah, Nolan, you touched on Canva earlier. I'm just curious what you consider some of the best uses of of that, and can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. So I, I'm actually a little new to Canva, um, but I know it, it's gaining a lot of popularity. It's a place where you you can design uh, projects and things um, without being a graphic designer. So it's all online. It's all sort of you know plug and play, and you know move things around. If you needed to create, let's say, a Facebook page banner, they have a, they have templates for that. So you can choose images, you can put your text over, you do it all online, and then at the end you download the image and you have multiple resolutions so and it's all fits perfectly for Facebook and you're done and you might spend a dollar on that you know once you download it um, so they have things like you know uh, Instagram you know templates and Facebook templates and, and things like that and email sort of invites and things like that but they also have what they call presentation slides now it's it's nothing like PowerPoint but it, what it does what it allows you to do is create um, you know, full bleed image, layouts, these are things that you'll ultimately download as a single image. So if you wanted to create, let's say, a super cool uh, title slide with a cool font and, you know, you needed some ideas, you didn't really know where to start, you could go to Canva, you could go into their presentation options and create a title slide, put your, your text in and choose, you know, they have millions of images, and then you download it for a buck and you throw it in your PowerPoint slide as your title slide, and there you go. You could also play around on Canva, get some ideas, and then recreate it on uh, in PowerPoint, or just download the image itself. You don't actually have to download it with the text and other elements on top of it. Put it in PowerPoint and then recreate it. You know, whatever idea you got there, you know, recreate it in PowerPoint so things are kept live. Um, so those are some those are some uses. You could use it simply as a stock image site. You know, forget the layouts, just search their images and download those. For like really, a buck each. I've really enjoyed Canva. I think you guys know I created the menu for our VIP dinner at the summit um, for using Canva, and it was so easy. So I think it's a great, great tool, and I'm really looking forward to spending more time with it. I'm, yeah, it is not a, it is not a uh, substitute for PowerPoint or Keynote or anything. It is a complement. I would agree, and sometimes I find things work really well, and. Canva don't work as well in PowerPoint and vice versa. I may start in one and bring it in, create the image in PowerPoint and bring it into Canva in order to customize it. So yeah. we have a question from Lindsay. Do you attempt to follow rules of composition for photography, like uh, not at a joint, you know, in a page or along that line? Um, yeah, I mean, yes. I, I don't, I mean, I not at a... I don't know what you, what you I mean think by not at a joint. Like if you have a full page spread where it would be where the staple is if you were doing some oh. of that. So Yeah, well in, in on screen presentation we don't have staples, so I don't have to worry about that. But absolutely if I, if I'm doing whatever kind of present you know, graphic design I'm doing, if I'm doing a print layout with staples, of course, you know, I'm I'm gonna move things around. But 
as we saw, the rule of thirds, having images face inwards, um, you know, cr uh, cr uh, having eyeballs align, like if you have a bunch of bio photos, you want to have all the photos kind of look the same, and one a designer trick is to align all the eyeballs. Uh, again, you want to try to have all the, you know, the cropping correct, but make sure those eyeballs are aligned and generally at two-thirds up of the box. So yeah, there are lots and lots of, sort of layout rules that you need to know the rules. Sometimes you can break them, but you need to know them to begin with. They will more often than not help you. We have a question that, you know, I know you've, we, we've, I've seen you talk about this before, but you use a Mac. So mm -hmm. why PowerPoint versus Note? Um, because PowerPoint's the industry standard and 99.9% .9 of my clients are on uh, PowerPoint. Uh, even the ones that are on Mac um, are using PowerPoint. So that's basically what it comes in. I mean, I, I used to, I, use, I still use Keynote occasionally, and I, but I used it more often for my own uh, presentations in which I had control over it. If a client says, I only use Keynote and I never have to share it with anyone else, um, sure, we'll do it in Keynote. But if they're like, oh, I have to always send this to clients and we have to collaborate and blah, 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 whether they're on a Mac or PC, PowerPoint is the industry standard. So that's why we have to use it. We have, we have time for probably just one more question because I know folks have to get back to work. But we have a lot of people who want to be able to access the assets on your website. But if they're already subscribed to you, how do they find it? Uh, if you already subscribed, you should have gotten a... Um, a link initially with um, where that was. If you've forgotten where that page is, or if you don't have that initial email, send me an email at nolan at nolanhames.com and I, I, will, I will send that to you. Great. Okay. I want to thank everyone for joining us today and thank you, Nolan, for your time and your amazing words of wisdom. I know I've got three pages of notes. So I <laughs> want to thank everybody and Dave and I really appreciate it and hope that you'll join us next month for Mike Parkinson's going to be doing Pitch Perfect, um, how to give and deliver the best sales presentations you can. Mike Thanks is for, awesome. Yes, he is awesome. I love he is. Definitely attend that. His energy. I, I will second that. Yeah, he doesn't have an off button, which I love. So I <laughs> want to thank everybody for coming, and this concludes today's webinar. Have a great rest of your week. Great. Thank you, guys.